people are enjoying their food. Uh, I'll begin today with uh, reading some passages from the book that we finished last time, book six, but we didn't get to uh, spend that much time on Reddit or are new or like forgot what is <coughs> but you have to excuse my uh, broken english i can read it well we'll change i'll read one and then you read it. I'll, I'll start so this is just readings from the uh, uh chapters or well, book seven in the uh brothers uh the one that uh, is uh, telling us about the elders also what isolation what isolation i asked him that which is now reigning everywhere, especially in our age, but it is not actually concluded yet. Its term has to, has to come, for everyone now strives most of all to separate his person, wishing to experience the fullness of life within himself. And yet, what comes of all his efforts is not the fullness of life, but full suicide. For instead of fullness of self-definition, they fall into complete isolation. For all men in our age are separated into units. Each seeks seclusion in his own home. Each withdraws from others, hides himself, and hides what he is, and ends by pushing himself away from people, and pushing people away from himself. Which is a characteristic of the end of 19th century. But it, seems, but it seems like the past 150 years uh, haven't changed uh, the overall situation that much. So that was the uh, uh, first one. Uh, the other one is dealing with uh, consumer society and uh, to some extent with internet and social media which Definitely didn't exist 150 years ago. You want to read? Oh, yeah, we, yeah. Since he's yeah. Whatever is underlined. The world has proclaimed freedom, especially of late. But what do we see in the freedom of theirs? Only slavery and suicide. For the world says you have needs, therefore satisfy them. For you have the same rights as the noblest and the richest men. Do not be afraid to satisfy them, but even increase them. This is the current teaching of the world, and in this they see freedom. But what comes right to human rights, but have not yet been shown the way to satisfy their needs. We are assumed, we are assumed, assured that the world is becoming more and more united as being formed into brotherly communion by the shortening of the distances, by the transmitting of thoughts to the air. Alas, do not believe in such a union of people, taking freedom to mean the increase and prompt satisfaction of needs. They distort their own nature, for they generate many meaningless and foolish desires, habits, and, uh, and most absurd fancies in themselves. They live only for mutual envy, for pleasure seeking, and self display. To have dinners, horses, carriages, rank, and slaves to serve them is now considered such a necessity that for the sake of it, to satisfy it, they will sacrifice life, honor, and the love of mankind. Thank you. Sorry, I'm leaving that uh, And the Next one, oh, this is for uh, people who have the same edition and uh, want to uh, follow whatever. The last one was from these pages, 313, uh, 314. And uh, another one for uh, all the parents here. Uh, I think uh, there is a nice passage about uh, leading and teaching through example, not through instruction. And it kind of goes back about uh, Elder Zosima saying that we don't know in, in where and when and in what ways we can affect other people. So see, here you have passed by a small child, passed by in anger, with a foul word, with a wrathful soul. You perhaps didn't notice the child, but he saw you. 
a new unsightly and impious image has remained in his defenseless heart. You didn't know it, but you may thereby have planted a bad seed in him, and it may grow. And all because you didn't restrain yourself before the child, because you did not nurture in yourself a needful, active love. Could I ask a question about that? <coughs> this part of that. Was it that the person had lost their temper and is that why the child wasn't nurtured? Because the person hadn't taken control of the person allowed to, and it was witnessed, unbeknownst to him, what was witnessed yeah. by a child that was in the proximity and able to, you know, see it, and therefore this child was impressed by, you know, whatever that, whatever bad that you may exhibit externally. And uh, this is why, I mean, I said it goes back, there is a claim throughout the book how, you know, everybody is guilty before everybody <coughs> this is one of the ways to uh, defend such a seemingly uh, outrageous claim as some people would say and this was from uh, 319 and uh, finally uh, the one that I think uh, was later uh, uh, the thought that was later expressed in uh, Bradbury's uh, the, th the Sound of Thunder, <coughs> you read the book about the butterfly you know, being healed and then the whole world is changing. You might have taken it from here. Uh, my young brother asked forgiveness of the birds. It seems senseless, yet it is right. For all is like an ocean, all flows and connects. Touch in one place and it echoes at the other end of the world. Uh, and so we'll uh, come back this is like the last quote <laughs> for the day uh, and just uh, you know set us in the mood and a reminder of uh, what we read uh, last time uh, in the uh, book six so I think now we are ready to uh, start moving forward and today we will be dealing with uh, book seven which uh, has the name of the main character Alyosha and the main theme or the main uh, question in this book will be a miracle. What is a miracle? What, what kind of miracles are possible? Or, well, this is all in terms of Dostoevsky uh, uh, asking and answering those questions. And we'll start with this quote from the previous book where the Grand Inquisitor and Jesus in the legend of the Grand Inquisitor are arguing whether or not people are able to believe in God without the aid of uh, miracles. And this is uh, like a shortened version. Uh, I'll, I'll read the, the full one. Is it how human nature was created to reject the miracle? And in those terrible moments of life, the moments of the most terrible, essential, and tormenting questions of the soul <coughs> to remain only with the free decision of the heart. And if you r remember, uh, you know, the whole setup in the Grand Inquisitor story, Jesus' figure in that story is sort of representing, you know, Protestant view is claiming that, yes, people need need no miracles, need no sort of aid in their faith and all they have and, and should have is just, you know, uh, individual personal relationship with God, that's it, you know, with no manifestations, anything like that. But then <coughs> the other extreme was the Grand Inquisitor who said, well, we'll manufacture mi miracles, you know, we'll give them this circus performances so to speak so that you know they will believe uh, and they will believe with uh, our help and uh, could I make a point about that so if you think about it in terms of orthodoxy we say the kingdom of heaven is within we say the Jesus prayer we everything is about your internal relationship with God in this case, they're taking that so that they're, they're speaking to the Western view of salvation, 
which is to externalize all your all these manifestations to demonstrate and to show somehow how God is like loving you or something, and it'll manifest in its um, external or out outward appearance. You know, and so therefore it's all based on what you can see and what you well, it's based on this world and the tangibleness of this world. So someone might, centuries later will ask the question, how can God allow a child to suffer? And they won't have any clue as to why that could possibly be. You know, because he loves us. And well, that sounds redundant. So therefore, when you start to reason it out and logic it out, it sounds makes God sort of come up short. But God does never come up short. You'll end up like uh, Ivan. You know, uh, end up like <laughs> Ivan. You know, so well, the manifestation, the manifestation, and even well, we see that clearly in this book. So in this story of Father Zosima. So you know, w w to avoid those two extremes, both of which obviously Dostoevsky <laughs> thinks are incorrect. And the answer, mm -hmm. as we said last time, the right answer is in the middle, and it's orthodoxy. So, to see, w and basically in this in this book, Dostoevsky is staging sort of a natural science experiment, where he will take his main character, Alexei, will place him in the situation where he will be, you know, for him it will be the most terrible moment of his life and we'll see whether or not he will be able to uh, emerge from that situation without a miracle or well we'll see I will not gonna give out not the plot but everything that's gonna happen but that's what this whole book is about to see you know let's place the guy in the situation we'll see what kind of miracles will be able to save him or are That's there true. any are there any kind of miracles out there and so on and so forth so <coughs> and not by accident just at the end of the previous book uh, they were talking about the uh, story from the old Te testament about job who was tested by you know god and devil to see <coughs> how w you know how strong is his faith <coughs> and uh, so this is sort of, uh, I guess, similar situation will be presented for, for Alexei here. And, and so I as you probably know, if you read this book, the first chapter starts with Elder Zosima dying. You know, the, uh, the person that Alexei loved most, and that was his spiritual teacher, uh, the elder at the monastery, and given how good the character of Elder Zosima was, how much good he did to everybody around, everybody was expecting after his death that he will be incorrupt, that his body, given how good his character was, that his body will start to perform miracles. And those who have read know that <coughs> everybody's going to be in for an unpleasant surprise but we need to look at the circumstances of his departure <coughs> and the, the events following uh, following that to see that Dostoevsky placed like well at least four or five clues very distinctly to show that this was the only possible outcome because of the natural circumstances surrounding the death of the uh, of the elder Zosim. So right like first or a second sentence at the start of the book says to us that the bodies of higher monks are not washed after death. You know, it's not it's not just an incidental fact of trivia that he puts there. That's like a first clue, you know the body wasn't washed. That's a natural circumstance that happened, right? Before they start reading prayers over him, and 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 then so this is the first night, and then he will be there for the for the next day. Uh, the time of year. Anybody knows what time of year it was? Early fall. Early fall. <laughs> Well, he already knows it, so 
<laughs> it's not it's not really fair but uh, it's kind of yeah you have to pay attention <coughs> to to kind of you know situate yourself within the book where it is so it's the early fall and it's nice early fall it's nice and hot out there the flowers are still blooming and so then when he there is a description of the start of the day the sun is rising up there is no clouds it's really you know like the early fall here you know it's a nice hot day in september <coughs> so the one was not washed second was hot day right third one it's on page 329 it's just a couple of pages into this first chapter in, in this edition it says there the windows weren't open so the windows in the cell where the body was were closed you know? and he goes on to say well people actually thought that there was a talk in the beginning maybe we should open the windows but then they were sort of ashamed of themselves thinking well how could we thought that the elder's body might start to smell therefore we need to open the windows let the fresh air in no no, no let's not open the windows let's keep let's keep <coughs> them closed so this is like a recipe stimulus <coughs> So what, what he is doing here, he's, you know, pretty much putting into your face that, you know, in certain, certain circumstances, there is no way but, you know, to have a smell from a uh, body that, uh, you know, is, is starting to corrupt because of, you know, heat and all the other. But there is a fourth one, <coughs> the fourth reason why it's happening, it's the, uh, it's throughout in this first chapter throughout the pages you are told these swarms of people are coming in especially when the day starts so so he, i guess he died during the evening or at night he was put in the coffin not washed it starts the sun is rising it's getting hotter and hotter and more and more people uh, start to uh, you know congregate in the cell with closed windows so if you've been here uh, on Sunday sometimes and you see people coming out of the altar and like pressing something on the wall it's like people getting hot, hot and turning off the air conditioning and just to give you an idea at least from the description in the book we are not getting even close to the amount of people that probably you know went throughout the day through a small room like this know people were waiting outside because you know he was the monastery elder everybody wanted at first pay their respects but then then when the word got out that something is wrong even more people came you know all those rumors and uh, all of that so uh, taking all of this into account you can see that the only outcome from all of this that you know dead body will start to give out smell and interestingly right at the end of, of the whole book <coughs> on the last page I think the last uh, next to the last page Alexei comes back to the cell after everything that's gonna happen during the day at night it was uh, after midnight already and it, everything cooled down they opened the window and not by accident there is no more talk about smell and there is no more smell and everybody is feeling well if you already know everybody is having all these sort of miracles experiences with uh, with the elder at that moment so what he is trying but then of course you know how all of it affected Alexei that the elder's body started to smell so he was expecting this you know supernatural miracle even though he was witness Alexei I mean to all these circumstances yet still he was so devastated 
when the miracle didn't happen and it was the reverse of the miracle, the smell of corruption. And so this is his situation. The person that his teacher, his spiritual guide, the person who he loved most of any other people is you know bailing out on him at the time when he needs you know some sort of support the most and we'll see that he is actually going to break down and follow uh, follow the uh, I'm not going to give <laughs> give you yet who's who's he's going to follow uh, so <coughs> why if you remember like the first book the first chapter when we were just introduced to Alexei he was called a realist right and there was all this talk that he would believe in miracles only after he had faith that his faith was not because he was witness to some miracle and that's how he converted that other way around it's only because of faith in God that he had, you know, he would allow for miracles. So what is happening here is pretty much uh, opposite of that characteristic. Uh, and actually, you know, he's committing two, uh, two major mistakes here. Oh, where is it? Anybody has mm -hmm. questions, by the way, before we move on? is against you know, is the fight against superstition, of course. But also, it's not just superstition, and we talked about, uh, you know, this, that he's trying to fight off the pagan influences, which superstitions are on, uh, on uh, Christianity. But also, you know, on the first day, I, I listed all those scientific discoveries that were made just before this book was opened. This was the age, remember, of enlightenment and reason and, you know, everything that Steve and Father John <laughs> were talking in their class. So for him, like, this whole book is also about how to reposition Christianity and, like, the rituals and the sacraments in such a way that they are not refutable or or could be uh, uh, questioned by, like, say, physics or chemistry or any other natural sciences. And we, uh, you know, we looked at some of them already, like, you know, what is this miracle, what is this sacrament of confession? You know, there were two books or even three books spent on that to show the real meaning that there is nothing supernatural there in a sense as long as there are, you know, certain condition of loving relationship and what that confession is supposed to do for you, you know, not by some magic relieve you of uh, certain sins that you committed, but it's like it's the work of you and your soul. If it's not being present there, if you're not willing to make amends and reconnect to the people, then, you know, there's not going to be any miracle. So same thing he's doing here with, you know, like r actual miracles. In this book, he will show how, you know, he said he will show that, you know, it's probably wrong for, for us to uh, expect some supernatural miracle, but there is still a space, a certain space and, and certain uh, time where the true miracles exist and and he will show how they work and, and what they are but that's kind of i'm getting a little bit ahead for now well i'm gonna just say one thing <coughs> and that's that uh, dostoevsky was connected to the optian elders and one of the optian elders um elder Nectari, for instance after he died in the late 20s he was buried and, and his body was just buried almost alongside a road. It wasn't really in a special place. When somebody found it and dug it up, he was first, and before they moved it back to Alpino, because actually his body was incorrupt. But then they put it back in the ground, and when it came out again, it wasn't incorrupt, but it wasn't, but it, but it smelled like flowers. 
It was like flower garden. Have a bouquet of flowers. Like the richest bouquet of flowers you ever smell. And that's what it smells like today. Or Elder Sebastian, St. Joseph's Father of St. Sebastian, the Serbian guy, Jackson. If you go to his the bones, they literally smell like a, flower, a rose garden. Like the strongest rose garden you've ever been in. So it's interesting that you mentioned that because in the book, towards the end, there will be a second burial. And everything is going to smell like a rose garden. But there will be natural circumstances and there will be like a there will be a natural explanation for that right so without <laughs> like so you know uh, giving out too much but he, again you know for him it's like we, we may not like here he gives us all the explanation that we need to explain what's going on but we may not know why and what and how all those things what's the reason for all of them happening but as i said he will have a second burial where the whole situation will be reversed and there will be no order of corruption but everything is going to smell like flowers but it's towards towards the end uh, towards the end of the book well anyway what what two mistakes or two faults or two sins that uh alexi is committing here first he forgets his elders teaching his teachers instruction to them to uh, where we just read about this ocean of love and how everybody is connected to everybody uh, and instead of this love of all and for all he limits it just to one person you know just elder Zosima is his uh, object of this of this love and he, he uh, and this is a big mistake uh, for another reason because at the same time he forgets about his brother Dmitri and abandons his brother Dmitri and because of that that might be one of the reason why for all these terrible things that are going to happen later to happen is that at this moment you know because of this situation he forgets other people that he should love and care for abandons them and you know puts them puts them in danger so this is you know one wrong step and the second step here uh, i think it's on 339 in the second chapter of this book he is looking for justice so he says okay maybe there are miracles maybe there are not but this is just an unjust situation that such a holy and and, and wonderful man dies and he smells and then of course father john would come in and say like, that christianity is not about justice <laughs> certainly <laughs> certainly uh, not in this world and that if you are looking for justice in a uh, christian church you are in the well, wrong I place have a good little story about that and uh <coughs> i was at the um uh, when they glorified saint john of shanghai in san francisco and um, he wasn't always beloved by everybody in, in the Russian church abroad. I mean, the, you know, some people were not as uh, in love with him as other people were. But one of the things that happened, though, was that at the day of his uh, consecration and when he was elevated and put into the church at Joy of All the Sorrow, everybody was there and everybody acknowledged what how what God had created what you you know had done with this incredible saint. So even if before they had doubted, even if before there had been, well he's not this or he's that or the other thing. The day he was glorified, everybody was in line processing around Joy of the mm -hmm. entire block carrying that casket and everybody was rejoicing that he was glorified. So it's not always how you start but how you finish. Right. <coughs> so and again you know the famous words that from that gospel reading on Pascha uh, at towards the end I forget the exact wording but something that has to do that you know the law existed with the Moses and that's where the justice existed but with Jesus Christ there is mercy and uh, and forgiveness 
whatever it needs to end up. This is for uh, what I'm going to be talking next. And I think I've mentioned it once before that throughout the book he has this scheme going um, about angels and demons. And this is actually another another example of the... Oh, I gave them... Uh, just leave them. Uh, whatever you don't need on the table, I'll, I'll pick them up. Uh, so this is another example of... Uh, you know, giving an existential meaning to all those things that we talked about in the church. So, throughout the book, we have examples of angels and demons uh, acting and influencing characters. And we remember who the main demon is, right, in the book? Yes. The Michael Rakitin, the uh, yeah. seminarian, yeah. <laughs> the career seminarian, as he is as he is called, and the way we found we we know that whenever he speaks, he invokes <laughs> he invokes the devil. But this is just one sign uh, that you can know. Uh, but here he will reveal himself in this book clearly, and he will be the the, the devil, the tempter. Uh, you know, just bluntly uh, in your face. But just in general, so in the parallel to what we have, you know, going on internally in characters, I should draw this Chinese sign or something. You know, where we have. That, you know, each character has two conflicting halves or parts, you know, the light and the dark, and there are different names for it, the animal and, and the, 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 the divine, uh, the base and the noble, that, uh, those are the words that Ivan uses. So in each character, there is always this conflict going on between, you know, or in each of us, there is this conflict going on between those two parts. But then externally, you also have, uh, you know, you would say good and bad people, but they're actually, you know, uh, manifestations or like existential meaning for the words of angels and demons. So you have people who come and influence you in a good way, you know, make you do something good or like Zosima would be for Alexei, right? Put him on the path to salvation. But then there are other kinds of people who see when you are weak or when you're ready to uh, make their own move or, or, you know, like, you know, ready to fall, and they will come and push you uh, in the direction that, you know, the, uh, the Satan would want you to go. So it's basically this double, you know, this, this, this conflict exists internally and also externally. Uh, <coughs> but, you know, so each character has its own angels and demons, but also one and the same character, as we will see later, at times can act as an angel, but at other times can be a demon, even for the same person. <coughs> And basically, this structure is also uh, like the embodiment or explanation for Zosima's, uh, you know, explanation of that everything is the ocean of love and everything is interconnected in this web of God's worlds. And, you know, this way Dostoevsky describes to us, you know, these passages in the Bible that <coughs> read about angels coming down and helping people or, you know, demons coming in and actually hurting people. And he thinks, you know, there is, uh, this is, this is the meaning of it. And that's against Father Ferropont, who we read uh, in the first chapter of this book, was, you know, making Zosimus fault that he didn't believe in the supernatural devils. He didn't, he was like, all the corners in his cell are infested with all those little demons, you cannot see them because you are not a true Christian. You know, so, you know, this is the opposite of that. 
uh, over there that froze. Um, like that monk in the island who uh, kept praying to, who didn't couldn't stand the guy who you know what the main character protagonist in the movie. It's like you you know you irritate me you you know you you <laughs> they're always irritated with that one guy. So I mean that's kind of what happens. People said about St. John of Shanghai that a lot of people were irritated with him all, a lot, actually. And, um, you know, it wasn't like he had the smooth life. Where, you know, it's just he was praying, you know, he, he had people that were, like, not always nice to him. And uh, not respecting him and speaking opposite about him, you know. Yeah, I think uh, it's actually, I guess, a common uh, situation at any monastery. <laughs> Um, if you can situation. tell that it, it exists in uh, Dostoevsky's book and it exists in the 20th century movie as well. Yeah. So with Alexei, since uh, he is our uh, main example here, say that this is him. We have Zosima on the one side. Right? And then if you recall the previous book and that long conversation with Ivan, he actually literally says, what's the purpose of them sitting down in that tea house and him telling all those stories about innocent suffering and, and the Grand Inquisitor's story. He says, I'm here to steal you from Zosima. So his, uh, that was his attempt, you know, to pull him in the opposite direction and plant the seed of doubt or plant the, the seed of darkness if you want to put it that way and <coughs> so basically now Alexei is being pulled apart in one direction by Zosima in another by Ivan who is bound to appear to uh, make the final push the devil himself or uh, Rakitin, as we know, as we know him by name, uh, in this book, and it's on page uh, 340, 341. It's the second chapter that it's called the opportune moment in this book, and uh, I will. I'm not going to read, so I'll just explain, and you can read it for yourself. So Rakitin, you know, all these bad things. The bad thing is happening, you know, Alex is losing his faith. He is running away from the monastery because the elder's body is corrupting. And so he's in this stage of, you know, this terrible moment of his life. And on the way from the monastery, Rakitin meets him on the road. So there is like there is this meeting on the road, two of them. So the devil, like the first thing that he does when he sees that Alexei is not in the right state of mind, and I think, if I'm correct, this was like the time of the fast, so it wasn't either like the remission fast or the one in the fall. Am I right? So there is some sort of fast going on, and he's still in the uh, this monastic uh, robe, and. Rakitin says, well, looks like you were busy all day and you look hungry. You probably want to eat. And he says, yes, I want to eat. Well, I will know it's probably not according to the rules, but I have a sausage. <laughs> Would you like one? <laughs> and, and Alexis says, oh, yeah, f you know, what the hell? You know, everything is going so bad. I'll have a sausage. And this is usually how, it's <laughs> how it starts. You know, start, how it works, yeah. start small. Okay, I'll have a sausage. That's his first temptation. <coughs> uh, what's he's going to offer next? Like okay, well now you you <laughs> you had you had a sausage, <laughs> you know you so might you might <laughs> you might drink as well you might as well uh, drink, and Alexei agrees to that. That's on uh, three forty two if you follow him, and you know after sausage and vodka, you know what's coming last, right? Sit up. Women. <laughs> yeah. so he says, well, 
I see you are, uh, you know, ready for <laughs> you. You're ready to go all the way down. You know, <laughs> well, let's go and visit uh, my good friend Grushenka. He was, she was waiting for you. Uh, and this is such an opportune moment. That's the title of of, yes. of the chapter. You know, let's seize it <laughs> and go all the way down. So basically, you know, this is what happens if, like, the miracle you've been waiting for, you didn't realize and you are not equipped to deal with it. You know, the devil is going to be waiting around the corner and, you know, might push you uh, <laughs> all the way down. But, I mean, on the one hand, it's, it's, it is funny, but, you know, on the other, it's, you know, it's a serious deal happening in the book, and this is, he's trying to show that, you know, the devil may not be this supernatural thing, uh, you know, that we don't really have ac access of, to understanding of, but it's, it's other people around us who have their own agenda. And of course, on the last page of this chapter, he explains what the, uh, What's the motivation for a kitten? It's a double, it has a double motive. I'll read it for now, and you will recognize who, who has those motives. His aim this time was twofold. First, a revengeful one. That is, to see the disgrace of the righteous man, the probable fall of Adosha from the saints to the sinners, which he's, which he was already savoring in anticipation, and the second, he had in mind a material aim as well, one rather profitable for himself. So who's who who had this like so one first motive is revenge. and see the saints fall and the second one is money well we know money is, is clean you know it's Judas from the New Testament you know the 30 silvers that he sold uh, Jesus for well if you were to abstract this to real life I would say that this is the very temptation that happens to people who get new who get, who get baptized as adults <coughs> and uh, <laughs> They hit a point where, uh, whenever they've been praying about something, they become disappointed about something, and who's waiting for them? Well, in this case, it's not Rick Keaton, but it's the devil for sure, and he would be glad to tempt you away from what you what you believe and just take you out. And when you're a priest, sometimes you see you, when you see things like that happen, you just kind of like it's not baffling at all. But it's this exact it's exactly what this is. This is a real moment, and Dostoevsky must really know this moment because he put it there like that. Well, I'm sure he was a really a smart man, for sure. Before the psychology was invented, he, uh, he, was, he was already mastering it. And um, so this is, yeah, go ahead. I have to, because it seemed to lead to that, but he doesn't seem... Not real. I mean, it, if it depends on what you mean by that. If she's like in the trade, you know, whatever is like your regular job that you attend to mm -hmm. every day, she's not. But if you mean that, you know, she would sell her body for like the highest bidder and try to position herself uh, based on that, yes. That, that, that she she is because I mean she wasn't like there on the streets selling herself but she lived with an old man who sort of you know was paying her and did <coughs> on the one hand whatever he wanted but then he would give her certain freedom as long as she would share the profits as well is that clear and that's and another thing you have to remember this is still 19th century the woman couldn't really be out there by herself you know like the, the dollhouse place I forgot who was who wrote that book you know about like 
woman couldn't open a bank account by mm -hmm. herself. You see what I'm saying? So she had to have this arrangement, you know, to mm -hmm. live independently. But we'll get to her story, like where it all begin, began, because it will be important for later. It all began when she was a teenager, and this officer from the army, and it was kind of common story uh, in Russia those days, I guess. The officer or the army regiment was, was passing by through town, you know, they saw a young, attractive girl, you know, enticed her. Most likely she could have been pregnant or something, or she w he would tell her, you know, I'll marry you, let's run away with me. And so once she leaves the house, you know, she's sort of dishonored, she cannot go back to her parents. And then the officer in a few days says, well, I'm no longer interested in you, I actually have a wife. And so now she has to do whatever it takes to survive because she's now by herself and she's still a teenager. I think well, when it happened to her, it was, I don't know, 14, she was 14, 15 years old. Right. So is that answering the question? So she's like dishonorable by the standards of society. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Certainly. Yeah. No. No. Like noble man would ever marry her. If that's what you ask. Her. Yeah. Anybody in like nobility, because at that time, you know, the the society was also divided. There was this lower peasantry or you know whatever and then there was this noble class the dukes and you know what not with all everything in between so anybody who is anybody would not deal with her you know what I'm saying no well I, this is uh, this is the best I can come up with and maybe it gets clear uh, more clear later so now we're done, you know, with Alexei's downfall. So we're well, we're let me say one thing about her. She has kind of a charisma herself. She oh, yeah. she is a very charismatic person. Yeah. Yeah. So she has learned how to entice men to sort of take care of her in a way. And then she she like like any commodity, you might say, she she only gives in to the highest bidder only a little bit. She has yeah. learned how to sort of move them along and entice them along mm -hmm. and and creates these petty jealousies and stuff that go on so she's like you know she's a survivor but on the other hand she's learned to be a really intelligent survivor. yeah so I mean so for example she, she never had I think she never <laughs> like slept with Dmitri or his father you know throughout the book but you know when she feels like like it she makes Dmitri take her out on this drunken spree for three days you know in like say in Las Vegas and he pays for everything and, you know she's having a good time then they go back and you know she needs like a business loan or a business favor so she goes to his father and says well maybe I'll marry you I kind of um, I feel like I might marry you maybe even tomorrow but today I need like whatever three thousand dollars because I want to buy this lot of land. So people are just loaning her money in the or giving her money or a loan. Yeah. Yeah. She says she's also at the same time she's a loan shark. So she does this she it says in the book she buys IOUs like you know people's promissory notes mm -hmm. that they may like what do you say like payday loans. She's making those. Okay. So you know she's uh, she's in that kind of shady area of business at the same time and and she uses herself you know her appeal in those situations as well okay. so you know she by today's standards we would say well she's just trying to survive mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. lady gaga and madonna style <laughs> <laughs> yes both of them did that well now <laughs> that uh, the devil got alexi by the hand and they're going to visit grushenko this, this in case for those who haven't read the book, this is the woman we've been uh, talking about for so long. And we are now in chapter 3, which is called The Ani, which may seem as a strange name for a, for a chapter, but you know, it's there 
for a reason. And I'm kind of, you know, it's it's uh, it's a packed it's a packed chapter. I think since we're just uh, adjusting to the schedule, I'll start on it today. But it's also good, you know, keeps people thinking for a week, and then whatever <coughs> the conclusion will be much much clearer that the next time we meet. So what's happening here? is that she is in this destructive situation what i've actually just told you about her beginning of her life how this officer you know took her from the family promised to marry her but then ran away well now 15 years later he came back so she hasn't heard about it for 15 years and she's been surviving living this crazy life all this time and he sends her a note saying oh I'm gonna pass by your town tomorrow or in a couple of days you know let's meet and <coughs> this news she interprets them uh, in such a way that when Alexei comes she tells him this is the choice that she is facing it's uh, one, it's both are on page three, 354 in that book, right? The first one, she says, I, I just crawl to him like a little dog, guilty and beaten. Uh, so I'll just, for short, I'll say, a little dog. Crawl. <laughs> crawl. Uh, dog, right? There's one 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 way out of it that she sees and then there is a second one maybe i'll take a knife with me okay, knife. so in the first instance you know she's completely gonna lose any self-respect <laughs> that is still there uh, and in the second case she's ready <coughs> to commit the murder you know? to revenge herself and kill. So in, in either scenario, you know, even if she survives physically, uh, if she follows either one, she will irreversibly uh, damage her life and live in misery thereafter. I think everybody would agree, right? So Dostoevsky constructed this situation that no matter what choice she makes it's it's a bad choice and only a miracle can save her you know from wherever she is in right now sort of like alexi was waiting for a miracle but here she's not waiting for a miracle but it's only a miracle that can help her to get out of these only two options that she sees for herself so this is the moment at which Alexei comes and I think this is where we will end for today with uh, suspense and I'll <laughs> tell you uh, what happened what happened next time that we Read meet. The book. Yeah. And and actually Read just the a book. quick note <coughs> uh, we after next time we're actually going to go very fast because the last chapter like last half of the book will cover much more quickly because we already talked about most of it <coughs> anyway and it will be just unfolding of the plot. Okay, any questions anybody? Any thoughts? Alright. Right. Right <coughs> Possessor of the offended, leader of the hungry, consolation of travelers, honor of the storms, visitation of the sick, protection and intercessor of the infirm.
Say.